It's been a long while, but in a previous video featuring the 7th Company, 3rd Battalion, Royal Artillery, we went over the complete process of firing a cannon in the 18th century. But of course, there is an awful lot more to say on the subject of Georgian gunnery than just how do they actually work. So this video is going to be just a little bit more eclectic, and we're going to go over a variety of different points that relate to the Royal Artillery in the long 18th century. Starting first with the actual makeup of these guns. Now, you'll notice both historically and in military reenactment that most of these guns are made of bronze. It's also possible to make them out of iron, but bronze was by far the preferred material when it could be used, and it's the same way in the reenacting world. Iron is a very strong material, of course, but it's also very brittle, at least compared to bronze. This means that if there happens to be any sort of a defect in an iron gun, any sort of a crack or a weakening of the metal inside the barrel, uh, as you may expect can happen after firing a gun so many times, well, an iron gun doesn't actually show that defect very clearly until something goes wrong. A large enough crack in the gun, and when fired, it could actually explode, sending iron shrapnel scattering throughout the air and even hurling out the shot at a dramatically lower speed, which of course, if you are, as many guns did, firing over the heads of your own men, well, that could prove complicated, to say the least. Indeed, in the modern reenacting world, iron guns aren't permitted at all on the field unless they actually have a steel sleeve inside the barrel, again, to prevent those, well, explosions. Bronze, on the other hand, is a much softer and more malleable metal than iron. Though I'm hardly a chemist, and I, I'm sure that one could go into an awful lot more detail on how all of these things actually work, especially how over time as our methods of producing these metals have changed and whatnot, I'm sure things may be different. But at least for our purposes, as relates to cannon, especially in the 18th century, this means that bronze guns will actually show their defects much more clearly than iron guns will. Before they just burst, they will actually bend and bulge the metal on the barrel's will, indicating that there is some sort of a problem with the gun that can then be taken care of, or that the gun will not be fired again. And if by some chance this happens to be missed, and the gun does still fail, well, it would be far less catastrophic than when an iron gun fails, because it won't shatter to as much of a degree. The burst would be more centered on a single location in the gun, and far less shrapnel is going to be sent into the air. That's not to say, of course, that it wouldn't still be terribly unpleasant for those surrounding the gun, of course. As I said in the previous video, safety is very important when it comes to these artillery groups, and every one of them is always keeping their eye on any sort of problem with the gun. No matter what material these guns are made of, historically or in reenacting, be they iron or bronze, well, they still have to be taken very good care of. Alongside keeping an eye out for those cracks or bulging, this means that they have to be regularly cleaned out, especially after the gun has been fired. The principle here in cleaning the cannon is roughly the same as with a musket. You run warm water down the barrel and sponge it out until the water runs out clean and clear, and as you can imagine, this can take quite a while. Black powder, you see, is very, very messy, and after firing a gun, it gets everywhere, and it ends up coating the inside of the gun with fouling or residue. This includes the touch hole, which also must be cleared, lest any blockages in there harden and cause complications in future firing. Just as with a musket, even if the gun is only fired once, it has to be cleaned afterwards, and so if you're going to burn powder, well, you may as well burn a lot of powder. That said, in an actual battle, there are some situations where it may behoove the artillerymen to purposefully disable their own gun, mainly if the artillery is being overrun and there is a risk of the enemy capturing your guns. And if this is the case, one of the fastest ways that you can ensure your own guns cannot be used against you would be to spike them. Carried in the ranks would be these little hammers, as well as long metal spikes or nails. You hammer these spikes into the touch hole of the gun, and it is at least temporarily taken out of action, because you then cannot ignite the powder that lies behind the shot. 
you would have to pull the spike out of the gun in order to use it again, and that's a very difficult thing to do without the chaos of a battle going on all around you. As you may imagine, these spikes are very tightly fitted into those touch holes. Of course, spiking a gun is very much a last resort for that reason. You really only want to do it if it's almost assured that the guns are about to be lost because of that permanent effect it can have on them during the course of battle. It would, naturally, be preferable to not lose one's guns at all, and for the purpose, Royal Artillerymen were also armed with these, the pattern 1756 carbine. While on their regular duties, these carbines would be slung across the back, out of the way as to limit hindrance to their bearer. At first glance, they may just look like a shorter brown vest, but there are a few distinctions to be made. The 1756 carbine's bore is smaller, being a 65 caliber as opposed to the 75 of the Bess. The brass furniture and lock plate are also smaller than they are on the land pattern musketry. These carbines were the artilleryman's defense should the need arise to protect their guns using small arms fire. They started carrying them in the mid-18th century, around the 40s, as the traditional defenders of the artillery trains, being fusiliers, slowly took on greater duties for themselves as regular line infantry. However, artillerymen only carried a few cartridges with them. I've seen figures floated around between 9 or 12 rounds per man. It's really just enough to fend off smaller assaults or to reclaim the guns if possible in the situation, but nowhere near enough to carry on a sustained gunfight. And of course, the carbines they carry aren't the only personal distinction of the artillerymen. Perhaps most noteworthy of all, the Royal Artillery also wear full uniforms of blue, a very uncommon honor in the army indeed. Uh, despite being often misnamed as a royal army, it must be remembered that the British army, unlike the navy, was and is not a royal entity. There are royal regiments, yes, but this is a distinction, not a norm. The royal artillery was different. They were a royal entity, and quite favored among that royalty as well. Blue is a royal color, and for the most part in the army, reserved only for the facings of those royal regiments. But artillerymen, who incidentally were also among the only men in the army who were required to be literate, wore their coats with a primary color of blue. This also served, as with the various facings and uniform traditions of infantry regiments or the reversed colors of musicians' coats, as a good way to quickly identify men of the Royal Artillery over other types of soldiers, both on and off the battlefield. Otherwise, well, I'm afraid that I don't have much by way of actual conclusion this time around, uh, but all the same, I do hope that these little additional details uh, prove interesting alongside the earlier piece on the actual drill used to fire these cannon. If you did happen to miss that video the first time around, I will of course be sure to provide a link to that video in the description down below. Otherwise, if you are interested in this particular reenacting group, again the 7th Company, 3rd Battalion, Royal Artillery, who operate out of the New England area, I will also be sure to include a link to their Facebook page. Otherwise, of course, until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.